I've been looking so forward to being here this semester, finally getting to know first years and to catch up with the later years. But now season two of COVID lockdowns begun, so I'll have to wait even longer. But lockdown has interestingly produced a whole lot of conversations around our dinner table. Every person at our table thinks that they know the solution to our predicament. Everyone is convinced uh, that all and every one of the contrary views is wrong and ridiculous. And so we play a game at our dinner table. It has no formal rules, and that is collect and critique everything that's been said about COVID from the day. So there are the comments that are from Talkback Radio, there are the comments from the newspapers as the social media and observations of people. And every comment that everyone around our table makes is emotion charged. Yesterday, my daughter, she was obeying the public health order, she was walking past a garage across the road and she saw, she says, 20 people exercising together in that garage. And she was shaking with anger and she called crime stoppers. There was such rage at those behaviours. And as she was speaking, what amazed me was I'm sure that everyone, my daughter and the exercisers, want the same outcome from this time of COVID lockdown. We all want to return to some sort of normality. No one wants it to stretch out any longer than it needs to. But there is a difference in how it can be achieved, how to bring, a, bring it about, and there are different feelings about how much you need to be involved in solving the problem. And those differences in the way you do things, yet having a common outcome, is the same in church. Same outcomes, but different ways of achieving goals. See, we all want, I assume, we all want the world to be filled with the glory of God. We all want everyone to submit to the kind lordship of Jesus. But how you contribute to that goal? What do you do? And so some of us will fiercely defend that the truth that was once for all entrusted to the saints, that is what we must proclaim. And we must stand up against the world's pressures to conform to its ungodly immorality. And there are others, for example, Tim Keller, who is so keen that we engage in faithful mission, he recognises that some of our message is unpalatable to society, not just to our society, to any society. And so what he recommends is we take what we agree with and society agrees with, and like logs that float on a river, on top of those floating logs, we float the unpalatable theology across the river. But of course, as he says that, some will call him a sellout. Some will say he compromises and some say he fails in responsibility of taking mission with the truth to the world. You see, everybody has the same outcome, wants the same outcome, but we can't agree on the methods. And it was the same too in the early church, the same goal and different methods, different ways of acting. And so today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians, and the reason for that is because I'm preaching my way through it in chapel. I spent five years doing four chapters. My wife actually says I'm just trying to drag it out till I retire. But here we go, just the paragraph from chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. Let me read it to you. I've written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, or greedy, an idolater, or a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from amongst you. So the situation here that we meet in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is a man who is probably having a sexual relationship with his stepmother. And that relationship is so shocking that even the unbelievers, even the wider Corinthian population do not tolerate it. 
And what do you do about that when you see that in your midst? I assume that every Christian in the Corinthian church had the desire, had the goal to see God glorified, but they were doing nothing about this. And the apostle Paul, who was their spiritual father, is horrified. But the question is, what do you do in this situation? Do you see that this man needs to come to his senses and repent? Well, the best way of doing that is that he hears the truth, that he's encouraged to make changes. And so the idea is you keep him close, keep him in the family of believers where he has the best chance of repentance, where he has the best chance of being influenced by the gospel of Jesus rather than by those outside. That's one way. The other is to shake him, to come to his senses, to excommunicate him, to expel him. Let him feel that cold, dark bleakness of exclusion so that he might repent. You see, same goal, different methods. I felt this. In a church that I led was a man who was in an adulterous relationship. I'd founded the church and I'd returned just having finished college. And so I was very wet behind the years. And I recall the day that we met for lunch. I spoke to him about his sin and he refused to consider changing. And I remember gulping and I said that he was not welcome at church if he continues not to care and to act the way he was. And so he left church and more than 30 years later, he hasn't returned to church. And at times I still do worry and I still do wonder if I should have done things differently. But before we look at what the Apostle Paul says needs to be done here, I wonder how it ever came to this situation in Corinth. How is it possible that a member of the church is engaged in practices that horrified even pagan immoral Corinth. And how could the congregation have done nothing about it or seemingly not even cared to do anything about it? Of course, you could ask the same question of pedophilia in the church or of the way that congregations in our day follow their leaders into immorality. Well, how it came about is not because the church lacked anything. At the beginning of the letter, Paul says that the church lacked no spiritual gift. But yet fairly quickly, their actions led to what could be unthinkable. Chapter 1, verse 17, that the cross might be emptied of its power. And as the letter unfolds, we see there are factions that are built around their leaders and that the leaders of these factions are marked by arrogance. And arrogance is always dressed the same. I am so good. I am above questioning. I know what is right. I decide and my decisions cannot be questioned. And the arrogance of the leaders for the followers, instead of challenging their factional leaders, they empower the continuation of their arrogance. And so at the end of chapter four, both the leaders and the followers are held accountable by the Apostle Paul. Now, this sort of action is not uncommon in our political world. You don't have to look very far to see that. But it must not be amongst Christians. And we who are the leaders must learn from this beware of arrogance and beware of so suppressing our congregations that they enable us to keep going in our arrogance. But now to the solution that the apostle gives to this appalling situation. His solution, expel the man. In fact, worse than that, hand him over to Satan. Verse five, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Tell you what, that is not having a bet each way. 
It is as clear and as blunt as you could get. This is the highest possible standard from the apostle. And as if dealing with this man in this situation, in this way isn't enough, Paul then applies that really high standard to all relationships. And so the advice from the, the command, not the advice, the command from the apostle about this particular person is now for all interactions. Verse nine, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Don't associate with anyone who is sexually immoral. I suspect that we might agree with the general idea that we would, but we would probably like this command maybe not so much to be watered down, but maybe a little bit more compassionate. Give us a little bit more wriggle room. This standard given by the apostle, this seemingly impossible standard draws out three objections. And they're actually like the objections that are going on at the moment in the current police enforced uh, COVID lockdown. First objection is, it's an unfair standard. That is, the remedy is worse than, than the disease. It's overreach. You've exceeded your authority. We hear that at the moment in Sydney. But not associating with immoral people, well, that can't be right. What about evangelising? What about engaging with our world? It is an impossible standard that the apostle, apostle calls us to. So firstly, unfair standard. Secondly, an unhelpful standard. It won't achieve what you want. The COVID lockdown will lead to depression and suicide. The economy will crash and not associating with immoral people will not protect anything. It's a big stick to say don't associate that hits nothing. So an unfair standard, an unhelpful standard, and thirdly, a double standard. In the Southwest, the police on horseback are making sure people don't engage with other people, while NRL players are having their parties. You see, you won't apply not associating with immoral people to your situation, you can't, it's impossible. And so you demand one thing of other people, but you have to live another way because it's impossible. So let's have a look at those three complaints. And by the way, Peter Orr wrote a wonderful short article for the Gospel Coalition on these verses, and I want you to go and have a look at that. So firstly, it's an unfair standard. The standard is just too high. Do not associate with the sexually immoral. No one can live up to that. No one can say that they haven't looked in lust and so committed adultery in their heart. You therefore cannot not associate with the sexually immoral. But to think that the highest purity and the call to it doesn't matter, underestimates the gift of God to you and to his church through his son. This is the highest possible standard and it's achieved because what God has done and is making his church to be. Verse seven, Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. You see what makes you, what makes the church of God special is the exchange of Jesus for you. We just read those really moving words in John 19 where Jesus gives up his life for others. And so we rightly and with joy proclaim that there is nothing better that can be given to any human being but the consequence of the sacrifice of Christ for his church is verse 8, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, Christ, our sacrifice, has created a church that is to be marked, is to be for sincerity and truth, for purity and integrity, for honour and uprightness. And if the greatest of all sacrifices has been made, 
And if the greatest of sacrifices has been made to create the church and to create a church of purity, we cannot, we must not settle for just a moderately okay purity. The standard of God is purity. He enables purity. And that is what we must seek to maintain and achieve. You see, this is not an unfair standard. It's a blessed standard. We should exalt in this that God calls his people to this and enables them to do it. But secondly, is it an unhelpful standard? What does the standard achieve? A lockdown, some say, has far more downside than, than upside. How can it be good for unbelievers if we have the words of eternal life but don't associate with the, pe the very people who need those words? We put up a wall that bars them from hearing the truth. Well, there are three important things to say in response to this. Firstly, do not associate does not mean do not go near. It's more don't accept them as fellow Christians or treat them as if they were brothers or sisters because it is absolutely right and a blessing for people that they recognise that their behaviours put them outside of the family of God. That's the first one. Secondly, this standard is actually good for the unbeliever. So just as the immoral man in verse one was delivered over to Satan so that his soul might be saved, so too people need to hear clearly where they stand to be able to, for them to see how their standards differ from what God offers. You see, if people who aren't yet Christians or who have enjoyed some sort of Christian fellowship but refused to submit to the Lordship of Jesus, if they think that Christians are just like me or maybe just a little bit better than me, why would they ever surrender their lives to Christ? And how does a person become a Christian anyway? It is not by you admitting or failing to admit them, it's by the work of God's Spirit. And so our task isn't to win people over, it's to obey what God has commanded. You see, salvation is his kind and generous work. And so the standard that he set here is actually for the good of the unbeliever. And thirdly, the standard that is set here is necessary and good for the church. We deceive ourselves if we ignore that bad company corrupts good character. And the old saying is true, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Sin and immorality always generate more sin and more immorality. Learn from the Garden of Eden. Sin is never an orphan. It's like an uncontrollable cancer. It gets into everything and it corrupts every good cell in your body. And accepting sexual immorality frees us. It actually frees us to welcome those sins that we so love and we actually want to allow to continue. Jerry Bridges wrote a book called Respectable Sins and he listed 14 sins that we actually think are okay and don't challenge ourselves and other people on. Sins like anxiety, frustration, unthankfulness, impatience, irritability. And we can so often justify or ignore each one of them. But if the highest moral standard is set, these sins that we so accept become more obvious. And so do not associate with sexually immoral people helps us to keep all of our sins at bay. And thirdly, is it a double standard? What about this double standard? It is unlivable to not associate with immoral people. 
in the scripture here, Paul actually does say, have a double standard, but this double standard of the apostle goes the opposite way to what you would expect. Normally the double standard is call on other people to do what is impossible, but because it's impossible, you and your group accept something that is less. By the way, that's why the world calls us hypocrites. We accept in ourselves something and we expect more of other people. But the standard here is actually the reverse of that. That is, expect more of yourself and don't judge the unbeliever. Verse 11, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, for what do I have to do with judging outsiders? We must call ourselves and those we have responsibility for in our churches to these high standards and to not sit in judgment on unbelievers. But I know, have to admit, and I'm sure we all feel, that it's ever so pleasant and comfortable to do the opposite of that, to judge others and to not set high standards for ourselves. In these COVID days, we have, the government has said, the responsibility to identify the disease in ourselves and to call on people who have been identified to isolate for their good and for the good of society. This makes sense and being sensible is all that our society has to operate with. But we have the supernatural but yet close and intimate God at work in us and in his church. And so our responsibility is to obey what he says. It is not only the only sensible thing to do, it is far more powerful and far more beautiful and far more effective than being merely sensible. In the Thanksgiving that we said together at the beginning of this chapel service, we ask God to grant us holy lives, that we might live up to what God calls us to do. Isn't that fantastic? Do not associate with someone who is sexually immoral. God works through this means to create for himself a people of sincerity and truth. Heavenly Father, please enable us to have the strength to take on board your high standards, to live them in our own lives and to call everyone around us to these standards as well.